you don't seem very shy. I asked you to come here and you were like, okay. <laughs> I'll come to the front. You know, that was you right there. You just came to the front, you know? There was no hesitation, right? You just came, no problem. I'm, I'm a big fan of nonverbal communication. So I don't need to use words to talk sometimes. I've been able to find people that are very under the radar. Nobody really knows about them in the big media. And I like finding them and showcasing them. Like here's, you know, here's me. Like if you give, if you give the really good answer to, to the question, and I know that you would be a good person to keep in touch with, this is what I do right away. Hey, that was so cool. Can we keep in touch on, on WeChat? Can I message you? You know, right away. I just go right away and they say, yeah, sure. And then I'm like, and we scan and then we become friends. I message you my name, my email right away, my phone number, so you have it, you know, so we're in touch. Don't wait. Well, don't wait, why are you waiting? If someone's really interesting, get their contact information and follow up with them the next day. That was great to meet you. You know, here's that paper I was talking about. What do you think about it? Do you wanna meet up on Thursday for coffee and talk about it more? I'll come with more research. Cause when you don't take this out and do it right away, you forget about them. They forget about you, the opportunity goes away. So seize the moment, carpe diem seize the day. To get connected right away to the person that you find interesting and follow up with them. Even though someone's opinion may contradict yours. Where's my friend Alan? It's all about your perspective. Who are we and what is the nature of this reality? So this is the opening of our question portion. So if you could maybe start with your name and then also what you study here at the Picking Life Sciences, okay? Okay. And then ask the question. Oh. Hello, Alan, I have a question. Uh, I am Tan Liu. I'm studying neuroscience and I'm an undergraduate student in Peking University. I have a question that, uh, what is your uh, background in, in your uh, undergraduate study and uh, PhD? Good question. And uh, I, I, I was wondering that uh, how can how how do you uh, uh, how do you get into the field of your interviewee uh, as fast as you can, and uh, how do you come up with a valuable question that uh, uh, take a balance between the profession and the uh, and the interest of the audience who may not know so much about the field? Mm. Uh, that's my questions. Yes, that's a lot of questions. Okay, <laughs> okay. Um, let's see if we can remember them. Okay, so the first question is about uh, my background and how I got into this. So um, I was uh, born in a place called South Dakota in the middle of the United States. And then I moved um, to California when I was 19 years old. I went to the University of Minnesota for two years and then I just went out to California because I wanted to execute ideas because I had just so many ideas. And so Silicon Valley is this place of executors and ideas and so I wanted to go. And I thought I was just going on a leave of absence for a, couple, for a couple months, but I ended up staying out there. So I didn't even end up finishing my undergrad. I've been there seven years, now I'm 26, and I've just been networking with some of the leaders in Silicon Valley across all these different fields. And I've been doing things like, since I was 23, I started taking a, um, a microphone and a camera and just going on the streets of Silicon Valley and asking different people what makes you happy, what impact you wanna make in the universe, What's something you did that last scared you? These types of questions. And then I started seeing, okay, well we can start producing shows around these things. So I started producing shows featuring different scientists. I was featuring them with comedians. I was featuring big, big future festivals with a thousand people in the audience, different types of things like that. And then it just came up that we wanted to do this every day. So we started doing the show every single day featuring different leaders every day on the show. Because there's just so many smart people and there's so many different fields. And so it's nice for us to be able to try and do as many fields as possible and share that. Um, uh, okay, what were the other questions? Uh, how can you come up with the questions that are uh, both uh, valuable and, uh, and attract the audience? Okay, 
So let's say you're, um, you're doing research on, um, let's say you're doing research on, um, on epigenetics. And let's say that um, you find that the person that you're doing research on also has, um, uh, has shared, maybe they've shared personal stories about how they've, um, about how they've overcome some sort of struggles in their life journeys leading up to the point. Because it's not all roses. We, of course, have some sort of struggles that we go through in life. So when you, when you, when you read content or you read their publications or you watch videos with them, there's always going to be interesting things that you can take from it about their personal life, about their scientific inquiry, and about um, just other things that you find interesting that then you you add your own spin to that then make it interesting for other people to ask. So for example, I like peop asking people questions about what their thoughts are on the direction of our world. So like a very big question about the overall direction of our world. Or I like asking them questions about what they think is the most beautiful thing in the world. Or I like asking them questions about if they think that are we alone in the cosmos. I like asking them big questions. And so maybe think about, yes, getting our questions both into the smallest aspects of epigenetics, but also these big picture questions about how the environment affects our genes over time. And just these bigger questions over thousands of years, but also about the nuance of the DNA at the most molecular level. So there's all of the in between from the smallest in the world to the biggest in the world and just thinking about who's your audience. Is your audience going to be people that are already very deeply interested in science or is the audience going to be someone that's maybe somewhat interested in science and they, so, so ex there's a phrase called explain like I'm five, ELI five, and that means you want to like, you want to be able to explain something to someone that's five years old uh, in the science. So think about how would you explain epigenetics to a five-year-old? That's a hard subject to explain to a five-year-old. But, so, but that makes it so that you become a really good science communicator, that you can inspire someone that's five, someone that may not, maybe they're an adult, they're 10, 15, 20 years old, 25 years old, they don't know what that is, you can teach them what it is. But then you can also go in to someone that's a scientist in the field that you can talk to them about it too. So it's kind of like having a varying amount of degrees of, uh, of, of of intelligence in the field that you can go and communicate it at the simplest level, but also at the most complicated level, and knowing who your audience is. Does that answer the question? Is that okay. Is there more question? Do you have another one? I don't remember. Okay. Okay. Sure, sure. Thank you. Yeah, the long scots All right. All right. Thank you for coming. Yu Dong Li, uh, here as a faculty of PKU. So you have your, this unique experience or unique angle of doing your job. And conventionally, people usually take sort of uh, existing rounds for their career. And I would guess most of people, myself included, will at least when we get started, will be worrying about our everyday life. For example, how to secure our pay for grad students probably get their PhD or get their degree rather than at least in daily life worrying about you know the sustainable energy mm -hmm. you know what happened there are aliens in the world you know mm -hmm. probably there will be or there is but everyday life we were just worrying about you know how to get my student graduate yeah. okay so how do you really sort of uh, get into this unique way? And how do you really balance? Probably you also, I would guess, start with, you know, have certain fi expected or fixed income. And oh, oh, you'll probably be r very rich to start with. And then you're worrying yeah. about the, you know, the big question in the world. So that's my question. Yeah, yeah, it's very good too. Um, so, this is, this is a hard subject because many of us have this, 
maybe this inner desire, like an artist is a very uh, simple way of putting it because artists have a strong inner desire to go and do something uh, that's unique in the world, but they don't necessarily have the ability to get compensated immediately for this unique thing that they want to bring into the world. And so, and same thing usually when you're going through graduate and PhD studies is that you also are usually not getting paid until you, your, big, your big opportunities until after you've graduated with your PhD and after you're doing something really interesting and people want to hire you into industry or academia. When you have some sort of a why, some sort of an inner purpose, an inner knowing of that, this is my goal, this is my destiny, this is my dream, no matter what, no matter how little I'm compensated for it right away, will make ends meet. In, sometimes in the United States and in China too, we were talking about this, sometimes people live in, you know, a couple people in a, in a, in a room, you know, on bunk beds. You know, if you, if you have to do that so that you can do what you love every single day to be able to achieve your goals, what your ultimate destiny is, then make the sacrifices that are needed. If you need to sacrifice your housing situation, if you need to sacrifice some of the going out, we don't, I don't go out. I don't go out. I, there's a very rare time when there's a group of people that are very, very prominent that I'll go out and hang out with. But otherwise, I spend my time working. And that's the thing. There's sometimes people go out to the bars or they go to the clubs, right? This type of thing. Sometimes they just watch TV for a whole day or whatever. That, you know, how bad do you want to be successful? How bad do you want to push the edge of science? How bad do you want to be compensated for your uniqueness in the world. And so when you want it really badly, you will figure out how to dominate a small market, that niche. So if you are going into mitochondrial studies or RNA or wherever you're going into, you can do something super deep in that vertical that nobody else is doing and you can become an expert at that and dominate it. And when you do that, you get compensated for it. And if, if you're going to do something like maybe be an artist or someone that has to take a little longer to get compensated for something, or like your longer term PhD studies, that it can sometimes be really beneficial to do something like find someone that's your friend, that has a family, that has a little bit of extra um, finances, or maybe a company that is willing to talk to you and ask them to be a supporter of you. Ask them for a, a sponsorship. And so that's another interesting thing. If you go and ask 50 companies if they'd be willing to sponsor your scientific studies or your artistic studies, you have at least asked. Maybe one or two of them will say yes. And then you'll get maybe a couple thousand you want a month to be able to pursue your interests. And so, these, what is a couple thousand you want a month to with big companies? It's nothing. It's zero. That's how much it's to them. But they know that if they say that they're helping fund some of the cutting edge scientists or artists or journalists, then they will feel like they have a deeper meaning and purpose, that they're working with young people on building a better world. And so these are the things we can do. We can ask our friends that have, that have parents that may be interested in supporting us. We can ask the companies that may be interested in supporting us. And those are just some of the couple thoughts that come to mind about that. Hi, Alan. Hello. Uh, my name is Jun. I'm a graduate student from Yulong Lee's lab. And now I'm studying some uh, sensory receptors for the drug development. Actually, I was wondering, yeah, you know, you have interviewed so many people in different fields with different uh, education and uh, cultural background. So uh, I want to know how do you understand them in your such short time, for example, research, understand their research or something? Yeah, that's a very good question, too. Um, so... 
This is a challenging visit for me because you guys are so much smarter than I am in life sciences, really. And so this is very challenging for me to try and keep up with what you guys are gonna be teaching me about your fields and how deep you're going and what you're understanding about the life sciences. And so some of the ways that I learn to, to deal with, with knowing that the person that I'm talking to is just so much smarter than I am in the field that they're teaching is I try and, you know, I used this word earlier, but I try and parse and synthesize. And so what that would mean is I would look at what you're researching and I would try and find, you know, there's this principle called the Pareto principle. If you find that actually 20% of your research is going to have 80% of the overall ideas that I want to go and learn from. So I need to parse your research for those 20% and study those 20% mostly. And so that's usually what I do so that I can at least have enough time so I don't get lost in the, in the, in the roots, but that I can you know, find the fruits of your, of your greatest studies fastest and then learn from those and then try and, and add some of my own creative takes to asking you questions about it. Yeah. So, yeah another question. Mm -hmm. So could you tell me the ultimate goal of you do, doing this? One more time. What's the question? Your For example. Goal. Oh, yeah. my ultimate goal? Yeah. For, to interview the top 15 people in the world or something. And the, what was the second I mean part? The, I mean the goal of you doing this. The ultimate goal of the show and of doing the interviews. Yeah, yeah. Yes, that's the question, okay. Yeah. Um, okay, if you do something like look at our world with a, a center point of of knowledge where the children that are born into the world are learning things like they're learning the language, they're learning history, science, math, etc. And then there's this edge of knowledge. So there's the center of knowledge and this edge of knowledge. So what I find most interesting is to go and take the cameras and the microphone to the edge of knowledge, to the people at the very edge of the knowledge, and try and have them teach what they know through this megaphone to the rest of people, so that someone around the world, and now people watch the show from around the world, and they message us from all different countries around the world, that they can say something like, oh my God, that changed my life. I now see the world in a new way. I have transitioned the way that I'm applying these principles in my career. So this is kind of like one of the ultimate reasons to do this is, why don't we have more people going to the scientists, the entrepreneurs, the artists, politicians, the leaders at the edge of knowledge and doing their best to try and interview them and share their wisdom, share their knowledge with the rest of the world and get people inspired and engaged in building the future. So that's, that's really one of the big things. And, the, and another big thing is that, you know, do you guys ever see like the over, overview effect of, you know, when you see the, the earth from, from space? Are you guys familiar with that photo? So when you see the earth from space, you know, you really think about all, it's approximately 100 billion people is what we hypothesize, have, have lived and died before us today to build this civilization we have. And it just gives you a greater degree of empathy and love for the, the entire progress of the human race to get to this point. And it makes it so that all of, the, all of these things about why would we be in war with each other? You know, these, are, these are crazy things to think about when you take this perspective of everyone has ever lived on this planet. And we need to be better stewards of the planet. We need to be better caretakers of the planet. Have a more sustainable civilization. 
And so that's why the sustainable development goals were on there. And that's why you know, having a show that at least asks questions about how we can all better work together, how we can better collaborate, better harmonize. I mean, that's why I'm here. I'm here in China because I really care about helping the world come together and collaborate. And so if we can show scientists and entrepreneurs and leaders that we interview in China on our channel, people around the world will say, oh, cool, this show goes to China too. This show works with China. This is cool. And so it doesn't become some sort of a us and them thing, but it's an we're all here together thing. So these are some of the ultimate, yeah, reasons, yeah. Hello, Alan. Uh, my Hello. name is Chen Hong, and I'm from, uh, I'm a graduate student in this university. And I have a question is that. Uh, what are you studying? In structural biology, structural biology. Okay. Uh, and and my question is uh, how to be not be shy uh, when you interview others and uh, and uh, be yourself. Okay. Could you could you come up here? Would you be willing to come up here? Remind me, come, come a little closer. What, what's, your, what's your name? My name is Chang Ho. Chang Ho? Yeah. Chang Ho. Okay. So, Chang Ho, your question's about how to not be shy. Yeah. Okay. What about, why, why do you ask the question? Um, uh, I'm, I'm very shy when <laughs> when talking to others so i i want to get some experience from others and uh, help me um, go out of myself you don't seem very shy i asked you to come here and you were like okay <laughs> <laughs> i'll come to the front you know, that was you, right there. You just came to the front, you know? So, how, but there was no hesitation, right? You just came, no problem. When I talk to others, I feel very nervous. And where, where does it, where do, you, where do you feel nervous, where? Do you feel it in your head, in, um. your, in your heart? In your stomach. I I think um, when I talk to others, my my mind will be um, can can't uh, work very well. <laughs> <laughs> right now, how do you feel right now? I'm uh, relaxed, but uh, uh, my my mind is. Uh, so you you say you're relaxed. Yes. Interesting. Because that place where you feel relaxed from right now, if that same feeling can, if, you, if we, you know, if we close our eyes and we feel this feeling of being relaxed and what that feels like, and then if we practice that feeling of feeling relaxed more often when we're by ourselves or when we're approaching people, so, Here's another thing. Out of, if you have a, you said structural biology, right? It was something that you cared about, that you're working on. Uh, actually, I'd like to do some MD simulation. Some about MD the simulation. Atom, atoms, how, how do the um, stru uh, structures, uh, how do the biology molecules work at the, uh, people can see the atom-wise things about the bio uh, biology molecules work in the, in the real life. Yes. And so if you want to find people to, to learn from that are doing simulation study, what, what is, how many times have you went and maybe asked people in person? Because here's, here's something that, that I learned when I was very young. 
I went and I started talking to people and learning from my mistakes. And so if we're willing to step outside of this comfortability, if we're willing to get maybe a little bit uncomfortable, because mm. you know how we take a little step into what we feel is uncomfortable and we try and learn and then we feel more comfortable and then we take one more step into what we feel a little uncomfortable. So when you, you, know, when you came up here so fast to come and, and talk to me about, about overcoming shyness, to me this is a great example of you just overcoming and just coming forward. And so that same thing is if you want to talk to somebody maybe in the field of, of, of MD simulation, maybe to you know, take that little step and say, hey, you know, you're in this field and I want to, and I've been researching your work and asking them a good question and then learning from that process and then going and you know, doing it again and kind of being comfortable with taking the little steps to do does that does that make sense? But, but so uh, yes, we we and then I needed to uh, maybe I needed to prepare the questions or just uh, when I interview him or her and uh, come up with the question uh, immediately. The, these two process uh, two approaches. Yes. Both yes. Yes, so those are two, so those two approaches are, again, it's kind of like we want to work our way into both those approaches. So the one where you do research and then you already have some notes and you already know the question or two you want to ask someone, it gives you a little bit more time to prepare and then you're ready with your question. And it's, it's not so hard to, to be shy. It's maybe a little bit easier to come, to come forward. Um, but... there's less shyness when you can do more research ahead of time. But when you don't have the opportunity to maybe do research ahead of time, and you're trying to think on the spot of maybe like the question, just what comes up. And a good principle that I've taken from experiences like that is think when something comes up, think even bigger has been something that comes up for me that I like. So when you think of something about MD simulation, think about what is, what could, like, why are we doing MD simulation, right? Why? What could be the best applications of MD simulation? What, how would this help our health and our science outcomes around the world? Do you see the, like, the big questions? Or like the little questions too, what's the best physics simulator that you know? You know, so does that kind of make sense? Like just to think about like the best big questions. And to try and like think big. So these questions are all prepared uh, um, before the interview. Th those questions, so th right? I just came up with those questions. And that's because I have a habit that I've developed of thinking big and abstractly about questions like that. And so maybe that would be something too that could help, is that if you find yourself, if you do have time to research, yes, research and get the good questions and then ask and learn from that process. But if you don't have time to do research, if it's just, again, like you, oh, look, I see someone walking on the street. Oh, wow, what was that question I want to ask them? If you don't have the time, then Think big, think big, you know, think as big as possible about their work and about the field, that type of stuff. And to you, sometimes that idea is on repeat of something like shyness. It's like on repeat in our head that we're living in, I'm shy, I'm shy, I'm shy. And it's just further programming us into thinking that about ourselves. But what if you were to say, during that talk, I confidently walked up to the front. What if you were to tell yourself that later tonight? 
Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll go back、It's, to try it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Try it and and see see how see how repatterning our language and what we say about ourselves can literally change how we presence ourselves in the world. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And、uh, my name's、uh, Alex. Call me Alex, and、uh, I'm a、uh, undergraduate student. Uh, and I、uh, will be a member of Ulonis Lab. So、uh, someone used to told me a、uh, scientist is just human being. There will be、uh, someone generous, someone will be mean, someone will be、uh, kind of gentle, and some will be tough. So,、uh, so my question is:、uh, Have you ever met some embarrassing interviewee, some embarrassing、uh, times, and in the in the in the interview of your past?、Uh, Uh, and、uh, how would you deal with this, especially when someone will be have a conflict、uh, about、uh, have a have a conflict on your point on your just、uh, some some of the view you hold、mm. is、mm-hmm. uh, quite、uh, opposite to him,、mm-hmm. and this is a question. So how do you handle with this? Okay,、um, <clears throat> this is good too. If anyone tells you that they've never failed at something, then they're lying to you. Everyone's everyone's failed at something. Everyone's had struggles with、um, aiming to achieve what they're trying to do. So I've had plenty of scenarios in interviews where I've just falling on my face. And and I I the mo- one of the important things to do in those scenarios is.、Um, You know, humility is a big thing for me because if sometimes I'll catch myself talking too much, when my job is to be someone that features the different leaders. So instead of talking so much, I maybe pause and figure out how to ask a good question next. And so, these aren't this. Another thing to remember is that they're not like it's not life and death. So we sometimes we get too consumed with. Oh, what's going to happen if I, you know, don't do well, etc. It's kind of like what we thought of in, you know, in in high school or like middle school when we were young. We were always worried about who likes us and if this is going to, you know, if if I come tomorrow to school and if something happens and I'm ashamed or whatever. Nobody cares about that. Like, look, you're, you know, you're 20 years old, 25 years old. You're not thinking about. Middle school, high school. So these, as as important as the moments are to do well in life, they're also not life or death moments. So to not like overly get worried about the moment, but also to know that it's important to do well and to have a good feedback loop with yourself, so that if you do go and you you know you walk a little bit towards that that uncomfortability and you and you and you practice. And you learn something. Make sure to learn it. Go back home, think about it, embody it. The next, the next day that you go practice, practice with the new knowledge that you took in. So that's a, you know, closed loop feedback for your own personal growth.、Uh, so, at the meantime,、uh, mm-hmm. yeah. At the at the at the meantime, you the you just、uh, have a conflict, and the people you interview will uh will feel something, will feel bad, will feel. Uh, maybe angry, and、uh, at the meantime, how would you、uh, deal with it? Okay, this is good. Okay, so if there's some sort of like a conflict、uh, during the interview, maybe of ideas or something like that. So, okay, so sometimes on the show, I'll ask people about.、Um, sometimes we'll talk about artificial intelligence on the show, and when we talk about. AI. I usually have lots of questions about AI. I have questions about narrow AI versus general AI. I have questions about the ethics around AI, about geopolitics around AI. All these big questions. Sometimes people will just say that I have no worries about it, you know. And you know, maybe I disagree that there is something to worry about it. And so I'll say, well, have you thought of the scenario of where? There's a runaway superintelligence, and we haven't had too much to say about the way that it 
goes off into the world. And so maybe they say, no, I'm not worried about that. That's 50 years out. And then I say, okay. And then we move on to the next topic. So it's, I never, I never, um, I never push to try and make people feel uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. So even if there's like a con conflicting viewpoints, um, asking a question is really good to see how they feel about it. Like, why do you feel like there will never be that issue? is a good way to think like genetic engineering. Why do you think there would never be an issue with it? If they say, I'm never worried about it or something like that. So to ask a question, okay. yeah, okay. yeah. Also just like staying peaceful, like equanimous, you know, even keel, because this is what we talked about during the talk with emotion regulation is that if you can stay peaceful, at moments of high stress, you can go farther in life instead of, ah, and getting really, you know, just and playing that on repeat the next day and the next day, the negativity versus, you know, staying more even keel. Yeah. And so treating conflict like it's also something that's a, like a learning experience for both of you. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Hi, Alan. I'm Yun Gao from, um, um, Professor Tom Fuchos lab and my major in the epigenetic regulation. My question is, um, when we, um, for example, attend an academic meeting and during the um, coffee time, we met someone that is a top expert in our area and uh, I really want to attract his attention. I mean, um, for example, to be his um, PhD student or be his postdoc like that. Um, do you have any advice that um, how I began the question. I mean, if I ask him a big question, he may think he maybe think I'm um, not the not the researcher here. Just uh, uh, how to say the other field the other field audience don't know the basic question. If I ask him a specific question about his research, mm -hmm. um, I don't know which one is better to mm -hmm. begin the conversation with the expert. I really want to get touch with. Oh, this is a really good question. Yeah, yeah. If you can combine both, try. So can you ask a question that goes into the very smallest parts of their research and it shows them that you've read that and that you know it, but then you maybe talk about its impact on a big scale in the world. So something like that. Because maybe you can combine the two questions. I and understand then, yeah. you mean that um, in order to make him realize as I also study in this area, so I ask a specific question and then I can, how to say, deep, deep this topic and uh, talk about its impact or effect or the future like that. Not just begin with the big question, yeah. like you interview people. Not like you interview the people you want to, uh, uh, you want to, other people understand this area. For me, maybe better to ask a specific question about the um, small piece of the, his his research, mm -hmm. and then I talk about its effect and make the question become bigger and bigger, just like that. Combine okay. yeah. both. And this is a big part of this is just trial and error learning for you, figuring out how to best represent yourself in the best way possible for other people to see you as someone interesting to collaborate with. So we go through a trial and error process of figuring it out. And at some point it may be that going into the, the tiniest bits and then asking that first and then going to the bigger stuff in a couple more questions is best. Maybe you can combine both into the first question and that way they're potentially more, they see that you think big and that you understand their, their, the smallest level of their research too. So I like the idea of just challenging yourself to find a way to maybe integrate both into the, the big picture. But, you know, but if you can't then, um, then yeah, then show them that you've went deep into their field with the first part, like you said, and then go your way up to the bigger stuff too. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And do you have your list? You have your five. You raised your hand, right? About yeah, your top. Yeah. Okay. okay. So that's the big take. You know, you already have your list. So what's next is you know, doing your research on them, finding ways to get in touch with them, 
finding ways to spread, <coughs> uh, maybe meet with other people in your community about the, that research, that kind of stuff, you know? So that's the next stuff. Yeah, yeah. Already okay. have the list. <laughs> Good, I like it. Good, good. Thank you. Thank you. Shesha. Thanks. My name is uh, Yoran Yang. Uh, I'm an undergrad undergraduate student from uh, School of Life Science, and I'm studying neuroscience. And my question is that, uh, in your opinion, what is the point of oral expression? Because uh, I think as an interviewer, you, m you may have many strategies for uh, expression uh, coherently and also calmly because I've noticed that you have many pauses in your talking so maybe it's one of your strategies to help you express your uh, ideas more coherently. Good catch, yes. Yeah. That is one of them, yeah. yes. So the question is what are the different strategies about oral expression at its best? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you, great question. What I'm doing right now is I'm taking time to formulate the best possible answer for you. And I don't have too much worry that if I was to pause for even 15 seconds that you would be you would be thinking, okay, let's see, what, let's see what he says after this long pause. So I don't, have, I don't have a worry about that. So that's first. So not to be like, oh, I have to say something right away. So that, you know, that silence is beautiful. The reason why we have music is because there's space, silence between the notes. We talk to each other, there's space silence between the things we say. So take your time to formulate the, the best possible thing to say. So, so that'd be first, is to don't be afraid of, 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 t of taking that time in silence and space. The next thing is, I'm, I'm a big, fan of nonverbal communication. So I don't need to use words to talk sometimes. And so just like that, maybe, maybe some, here's a your most simple one. It's actually really interesting to think about why did these evolve? Why do we have eyebrows, right? What, one of the big hypotheses about why we have eyebrows is because of nuance in facial expressions, in communication. Of course, there's other things about sunlight and so that we can actually see better absorbing sunlight. So when you say something interesting and you finish your sentence, blah, 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 And then I didn't say anything. You, you saw my eyebrows and my mouth go, wow. You saw my eyebrows rise up. You saw my mouth go, wow. But I didn't say anything. And I gave you that three seconds without saying anything. All of a sudden, you pick back up on your next thought. So by not saying something in that small gap of time and by expressing non-verbally, you can let someone go on to their next really interesting thought. Whereas if you would have said something, you might have cut it off. So I'd say non-verbal communication's big. You know, eye contact is obviously big. Another thing is just to be, have a really good balance between humility and confidence. So, be confident in your speech. I'm talking with my hands and I'm talking loudly because I'm confident in my body posture, in my gesticulation, I'm confident and my voice is loud. And, but balance that with humility. 
So if I need to, I can tune it back and I can be quieter and I can be calmer and I can be more warm and inviting. And I can be humble when I know that you have so much to teach. So it's kind of those things are big ones for me on how to orally present oneself at the best. The two, the, the two mics, so funny. Um, hello, Alan. Um, I'm Tong, an undergraduate student studying biology. And I really appreciate your idea to share the, uh, the opinions from the greatest minds to everyone. But I wonder whether you question too much in your daily life. Because your job is to ask questions. So I wonder what about when you are dealing with your families and friends, how do you still question that big questions? I think for daily lives, we have to let it go sometimes. So how do you deal mm. with that? Mm -hmm. How do you balance between your thoughts uh, w when you're at work or and the ones when you're at home? Mm. Um, mm. Mm, interesting question. Okay. We've all had the scenario where we're maybe we're butting heads a little bit against our mom or our dad or our brother or our sister in some way. We're butting heads a little bit. And we know that if we, if we double down, if I push a little harder, most likely you're not going to end up, they're going to say, oh, okay, now I understand, and then they'll agree with you. Most likely not. It usually ends up if you push even harder, they push harder too. So sometimes it's better to ask, if you can, ask a question, you know, why do you think that way? And then learn from their perspective, and then thank them, and then move on to the other thing. And so that's, that's big because um, a, a, a happy family is, makes for a happy work and a happy the rest of the life. So this is, this is very important to make sure at home everything is calm and loving and compassionate and vibrant and, uh, and not, you know, hectic and chaotic and evil and all that stuff. So, um, so to do our best to, to kind of like, you know, be the loving force at home, be the love, the force of love at home. And then that will help all of a sudden, maybe your mom or dad or brother or sister will become more loving as well. And you'll be like, how did that happen? And that usually comes from you. And it usually comes from us from changing our behavior and our approach to it. So, yeah. The, the, the thought was, I seem to be pretty good with my family. I, I've, I had to also go through a very uh, long training process myself of, I used to push, push, yeah. push, and I'd, I'd just get hit back in my face all the time. And then I stopped pushing and I started asking a question about it. You know, how, why do you think that way? How do you feel about that? And then they answer and I say, and then, and I just lay off. And maybe, you know, if someone's feeling a little bit agitated, um, go, go out to go, to, go for a walk, go out to nature, come back. You know, you'll be more calm, they'll be more calm after some time away too. But I, I, it took a long time for me to get better at it. And now also the relationships get better over time. Like, Another really important thing about this is, you know, how many of you still have um, both of your parents are alive? All, almost all of you. How, how many of you are they still together in the same house? Maybe you're still together in the same house. Okay, so not, not so many. So, but why, why I ask is because you have, you have this, you have this, a mom and dad that brought you into the world. 
if they didn't decide that they were in, in love and they wanted to have a child and bring a child into the world, you wouldn't be here. And so at least for us, when we get older, when we're maybe 25, 30 years old, we're a little older, some of us even when we're only 20, 20 years old, if we can do this when we're just 20, it's even better. But can you go up to your mom and can you tell her, I love you. Thank you for holding me in your stomach nine months, growing me in your stomach and bringing me into this world. Can you tell her that? And what would happen if you did? What would happen to your dad if you told your dad, thank you so much for bringing me into this world. Thank you for the support and the love. Because when you were a child, when you were zero, one years old, two years old, did you make money and pay your own rent? No. Your food was there for you, your rent was there, your house was there for you, all these things were there for you. It's because your parents did it. So if you can remember to go back to the parents and to tell them thank you for that, it changes our relationship with our parents and it makes for the family to be a happier, healthier place, which makes your work healthier, happier in the rest of your life. My name is uh, Yuan Gong Zhu. I'm majoring cell metabolism. Uh, through this talk, I'm wondering, some people talking interesting and some, some people boring. Not the words, not their appearance, not their face. I'm wondering how to turn to right turn or hers to get right communication. Okay. So, say the question again. Uh, how to turn to right tongue or hers to get right communication? Some like. The right uh, tone and the right yeah, yeah. words yeah. for the right communication. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Life sciences is familiar with mirror neurons. So if you, if, if I, if the person you're talking to is a little bit, maybe they're moving with their hands, maybe they have higher energy, then you too may be a little bit hand movement, a little higher energy. If they maybe take a step back and they're quieter and they're calmer, then you also quieter, calmer. Mirroring them helps them become more comfortable. And in terms of tone and the right words, something that comes up for me about the right words is that and even tone, is that, um, you know how when someone uh, finishes one of their statements, they can kind of like, they can finish their statement with a tone that kind of makes it seem like it's a question, but they didn't ask it like a question, they said a comment, but it was like question, and they kind of may go like this at the very end. So. What you're doing by doing something like that is um, you're showing more vulnerability and you're showing more humility and you're showing that um, you may not be right. And so it, it help, it's helped me a lot as an interviewer. For me, when I venture into something that I don't know much about, right? Let's say like neuromodulation. And I might say, um, you know, is it, is it, you know, maybe the, I ask a question about optogenetics and I ask like, well, could optogenetics be helpful for eradicating Alzheimer's? And I, you know, I ask it like this. So I'm saying, well, could it be helpful? Or I read it that it was helpful. What do you think? You know, so my tone and my words show that I'm very vulnerable and humble and open to them teaching me. Versus if I say that, well, I read that it was helpful and and, you know, and the, you know, they'll be like, well, you know, so the, there's like, there's this, can, you, can we carry a tone of, of maybe softer or more gentle with, with the way that we um, ask? And then another thing that came up was that I've, I've overstretched myself before. And I mentioned that earlier too, that, uh, 
be careful with words. Sometimes it's better to use a more simple word than to incorrectly use a more complex word. So that's been something else that I've learned. So, um, also, one more thing. Take a question that you're asking, write it down, Can optogenetics eradicate Alzheimer's? Write it down again below it and change up some of the words. Can optogenetics eradicate neurodegeneration? You know, neurodegeneration being more broad. So can you change the words in the sentence if you write it, you know, five times changing the words in it? and you can make it so that the sentence itself is the best version of the sentence that it could be, the question. This is what authors do, authors of books. They go and they take a specific sentence in the book and they write it out 10 different ways and they find the best way the sentence expresses the most meaning and they put it back into the, into the book before they publish it. This is how they work on iterations of the sentences. So think of the best possible words to use in the, in the sentence, the best structure for the sentence. Meng Shao Shuai, major in biophysics, and uh, uh, would you like to share uh, some of your uh, most enjoyable and self-satisfied interviews? My most enjoyable yeah. interviews? Yeah. Yes. And what would, you, what would you like to know, like the person I interviewed, the subject, why I enjoyed it, this type of stuff? Yeah, all of them. All those? Okay. Yeah. Thank you for asking. Something that a lot of people aren't uh, thinking about is how to both find people, like we were talking about this list of these hot five, hot 10, hot top 20 people, how do you have both people that are already like, they have lots of prominence, they have lots of papers, they have lots of, you know, big, big, big stuff, big badges. But how do you also find the people that don't have any of that, but that are doing very interesting work? And so that's been something for me with the people that we've interviewed. I've been able to find people that are very under the radar. Nobody really knows about them in the big media. And I like finding them and showcasing them. So like Sandy and Joyous Heart were two that are really deeply passionate about spirituality and about meditation and about ways of self-actualization, of bringing ourselves fully into the world. And I found them, featured them. But then on this other side of things, there's people like, you know, Dr. Jordan Peterson, or Dr. George Church, Dr. Max Tegmark, right? These other leaders that are already in the media. They've done TED Talks. They've, uh, they go and frequently speak in front of a thousand people, you know, whatever. They have tons of papers, tons of companies working on big challenges in the world. And so I like featuring them and learning from them too and asking them questions that they've never been asked before. That's a big one. Because how often do they get interviews? A lot. How often do they get a question that they've never been asked before? Not so often. And so if you ask them a question that they've never been asked before that shows them that you understand their most important parts of their view and also that, wow, I've never been asked it that, that before, then you earn a place in their in their worldview as someone that they remember. They'll remember you. And so that's another thing is to strive for such excellence in the world that people remember you. I like it when it feels like the guest and myself are 
are harmonizing, are vibrating on a very high level. So I try and make an environment where they can feel most alive, most coming from their heart and their mind and their spirit, soul at their best. And so I like, I like that. that. That vibe makes me feel most alive too. And it likely makes our audience feel most alive. So those are, those are the big ones. But yeah, everything from the complete people don't know of all the way to the, peop the ones that people do know of and um, Okay, and, uh, and the following question is, yes. how do you find the interesting people that are under the comment later? Reader, yeah. It's a great question too, yeah. Something really interesting that was discovered maybe about, I think almost five years ago now, is that um, you can tell by someone's uh, fanaticism or basically by how um, endogenously motivated they are, which means like how intrinsically motivated they are. So I'm not motivated by a car or a house or a watch, um, but I'm instead I'm motivated by scientific discovery. I'm motivated by bringing myself most fully into the world, that type of stuff. So the more that they're endogenously motivated, the more they do really weird things. Like you'll find someone that's maybe under the radar, you'll find them like on the internet talking about like some of the deepest stuff in that field at like three in the morning. So how's, how passionate does someone have to be about the subject if they're going to be online talking about it at three in the morning? So you've, it's like very there can be some very interestingly weird ways to find these people. So when you, so when you go out to, uh, do you guys do like networking events, right? So when you go out to like a networking event, remember I mentioned to you guys earlier that I rarely go out, but when I do, it's to a big networking event that I want to connect with people at. And so, when you go there, you can do something like have your, maybe you want to become a co-founder of a company. So you're trying to find the partner to co-found the company with. Or maybe you want to find the person there that knows about the specific thing that you're looking for. What you do is you, you, you forming that question and if you write it down a bunch of times and you figure out how to best ask it, you're basically, you're querying the event. You're running a query of the event. And so you go and you ask the question, you ask the question, you ask the question, 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 question. You ask the question to as many people as you can and you find the ones that give the best response. Those are the ones that could potentially be your co-founder or those are the ones that could help you with that research, that type of stuff. So the more people that you ask that question to, the more likely you'll find the someone that is the right candidate for either the interview or for the <coughs> founding of the company, that kind of stuff. So that's been another thing that I've, that I've done quite a bit. Yeah, and I'm also a little bit like, like here's, you know, here's me. Like if you give, if you give the really good answer to, to the question and I know that you would be a good person to keep in touch with, this is what I do right away. Hey, that was so cool. Can we keep in touch on, on WeChat? Can I message you? You know, right away. I just go right away and they say, yeah, sure. And then I'm like, and we scan and then we become friends. I message you my name, my email right away, my phone number. So you have it, you know, so we're in touch. And so don't wait. Well, don't wait. Why are you waiting? If someone's really interesting, get their contact information and follow up with them the next day. That was great to meet you. You know, here's that paper I was talking about. What do you think about it? Do you want to meet up on Thursday for coffee and talk about it more? I'll come with more research. Because when you don't take this out and do it right away, you forget about them. They forget about you. The opportunity goes away. So seize the moment. Carpe diem, seize the day. Get, the, get connected right away to the person that you find interesting and follow up with them. Basically, like the high throughput 
screening <laughs> technology <laughs> just in biology fields. Yeah, yeah. Is that it? We're done with questions? Does everyone feel that's good? If, if anyone has questions, we can talk about talk at with lunch. Adam after the talk or every day. Here and Ellen yes. will leave China on Wednesday ne next week. Yes. Yes. So before the Wednesday, you can come to the Lisa Hall building to talk with Ellen. So, so the opportunities are we have lunch happening now. You guys can come lunch, talk. We have uh, every, every day I'm going to be doing interviews here. So if you want to um, have lunch or, or dinner together, just um, connect with me on WeChat and we can um, meet up and we can do lunch or dinner together. Um, I know that a lot of you are doing really cutting edge research too, so I want to learn from you. So I'd love to ask you questions about you know, your life here in China, about what you've been studying, all that kind of stuff. I find it really interesting. I'll be happy to share with you about what's happening in Silicon Valley too, in California, in the United States. Um, just remember the, you know, the things that we talked about Take action. Take action. That's most important. Otherwise, we go back to the same that we were. So if we can take at least one new habit and begin implementing it, that can make a big difference in who you meet, who you work with, what you pursue, how much money you make, how successful you are, all that kind of stuff. So. That's, I'm so grateful to Peking University, to Shui Lin, to Yulong, to all of you guys for coming. Thank you. Shui Shui, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. I, I have learned a lot from your lecture today. Of course. Yes. I think Thanks, some Chinese people are more shy and they are not going to uh, get, get in touch with, uh, with other people. Even they think they are interested and maybe helpful for their future. And uh, uh, for me, I, I uh, watched a lot of American movies and uh, I learned a lot from American culture that they are never, never feel uh, they are lower, uh, in a lower case or uh, feel low, pro I guess, in low priority. Mm. Mm. I want to say oh, wow. that, yeah. that uh, I, I think uh, uh, Americans, they have a, a big advantage that is they never feel they are incompetent and yeah, uh, I, I am trying to do that uh, uh, to learn from to learn from them so I want to uh, can I have your WeChat? Of course you? yeah <laughs> you you were so confident you came right up right away you know what I mean from when you said that you're like, I'm shy, and then you walked all the way up. You know what I mean? Sometimes it's a mindset thing. And like, if we change the way that we think about ourselves, we can change the way that we come into the world. Is it true? It's part, yeah, it's partly true, and actually quantum mechanics is proving more and more that that's true. You have all of the potentials, and you can pick which one you want to... I'll talk, if you stay for lunch, we'll talk. Talk, yes, okay, okay. For lunch? Okay, cool.